we'll get started. Everybody cool with that? Val, you wanna give me a thumbs up, we ready? All right, um, as you can see, I can barely contain my energy. I am super excited about tonight. I Let me introduce myself though, as I calm down, I'll catch my breath. Um, so I'm Lisa Henderson Bennett, and I am the president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Omicron Upsilon Omega Chapter. And guess you are in for a marvelous time. I've had a little bit of time to spend with our special guest and picked up on their energy. Um, they didn't say much, but their energy just radiated through the screen. So I think it's going to be an amazing night. Our chapter has adopted two colleges this year. It was a part of our HBCU for Life initiative. And I won't um, steal our chairman's thunder, but I did want to welcome our guests who represent those two universities. And that's Dr. Anna Isbell from Norfolk State University, who will be sharing her art collection, and Mr. Wendell Brown from Benedict College, who will be sharing their art collection as well. And of course, I want to thank the chairs for their thoughtfulness, their innovation. This is a very creative program that you all have put together. And those chairs are HBCU for Life Chair, Ms. Naquanya Perry, and our Arts Chair, Ms. Kennedy Woods, and her co-chair will be um, bringing you greetings tonight, Ms. Zena Scott. So I will not belabor this. I know you all are excited to see this wonderful art. Um, I have to thank um, Ms. Valerie Cooper, who is on both of those committees, the Arts and the HBC for Life Committee. She is a art curator with Picture That Arts, and she is a proud alumna of the Morgan State University. Go Bears, are they brown bears? I got it right, okay. Um, so I will not um, belabor this. I want to turn it over to Ms. Perry and Ms. Scott who will bring you greetings um, and let's enjoy a wonderful art tour. Thanks for joining us. Good, e Good evening, everyone. Thank you for, my name is Nikwanya, as Lisa said. Um, thank you for attending our art tour collection. So the purpose of our HBCU um, is to establish to serve educational needs of Black Americans. HBCUs are important because they provide students with a higher role in education. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Sorority Incorporated supports HBCUs by encouraging financial support uh, we provide scholarships and we help students remain in school. We also cultivate and encourage high scholastics and ethical standards. We provide unity and friendship among college women and to service to all mankind. So I am the chair of the HBCU and we picked uh, Bennett and Norfolk State. I am an alumni, a proud alumni of Norfolk State myself. Um, and the reason why we picked that those two schools is because Norfolk State, they have an excellent STEM and athletic program. We also picked Benedict, the same reason, they have an excellent STEM and cyber and security mass communication business programs as well. And we hope that our students will continue to uh, come to the schools, um, go back for homecoming, you know, continue education-wise, get higher degrees. And we just, I just wanna say thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity to present to you. So I'm going to pass this on to Zena. Greetings, friends. On behalf of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Target 4, the Arts Committee, we welcome you this evening to this evening's event. Spearheaded by International President Dr. Glenda Glover, this program aims to expose students to arts, enrichment, and culture by fo focusing on visual and performing arts. We are delighted to have our distinguished panelists with us this evening and hope you leave here with no new knowledge on HBCU art and art collections. Thank you and enjoy.
Okay, so I just want to um, come in and say to our uh, president of Omicron Upsilon Omega chapter, which is based in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, we are a small yet a small yet mighty chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Uh, by the way, we made our not only did we make our one million dollar HBCU fundraising goal yesterday, we surpassed it. The last I saw, I think it was two point something million. So round of applause for everybody that supported us. Every dollar counted, and we really do thank you because it will ensure that students that are attending Norfolk State University, Benedict College, and many others uh, will have a chance um, at success. So we really want to thank you for that. Um, I want to also thank the Target One HBCU uh, Committee Chair, Naquanya Perry, and Target Four Arts Committee member, uh, Ms. Zena, for allowing me to invite both universities uh, to present their very important and prestigious art collections this evening. So before we get started with the virtual tour, um, just a little bit about the HBCU art collections overall. And I'm gonna attempt to share my screen if I can. Let's see, oh, it says it's disabled. So uh, Ms. Kirsten, if you can allow me at some point, okay, it looks like I'm able to now. So you may be wondering, um, you heard from uh, Ms. Nakwanya talk about why we adopted uh, the two colleges that we did uh, for HBCU week, both Norfolk State and also Benedict. And she impressed upon you that the importance was because, well, she was an alumni of Norfolk State, so she was a little biased, but uh, <laughs> she impressed upon you the importance of both of their STEM programs that and degree programs in STEM fields that they offer students, um, in particular in technology, cybersecurity, and the likes. Um, so you may be wondering, well, why are we talking about art? Well, the art collections uh, across HBCUs and their there are 107 that are in existence today. I'm gonna to click on this link so that you can kind of have a sense of the scope of the HBCUs. Oops, I wanna go back, didn't wanna go that far. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen and the list of HBCUs. Yes, President Lisa, okay. So note that they're in many states, Alabama, Arkansas, California, Delaware, DC, Florida. And as you think about where these institutions are located, imagine the rich cultural heritage uh, about African-American people, about African people, Caribbean people that must live within the communities and neighborhoods that these HBCUs are based in. And also imagine that unless you are really ambitious, you're probably never gonna get in your car and drive to Norfolk State and then crisscross over to Texas to Prairie View and then go to Clafton and then go to Lane and then go to Benedict. And, and so the question is, if you don't do that, what are you missing in terms of the history that the art collections actually have to offer and present from each institution? So the goal of the project that we're gonna talk about tonight is called the HBCU Digital Art Project. And it's really intended to uh, provide one-stop shopping under one roof of all the HBCU art collections nationwide. And as we, I didn't mean to get out of it. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. So as we um, are able to develop relationships with HBCUs that are interested in sharing their art collections, we bring them into this, what we call the HDAP fold. And so tonight you have a very special treat. You're going to see the collections of Norfolk State University um, and also Benedict College and realize that most of the art collections were started uh, shortly after the colleges themselves. So Benedict College, um, can somebody take a guess? 
that knows your HBCU history, you can put it in the chat. What year was Benedict College founded? And what year was Norfolk State founded? Does anybody want to take a guess at that? Get some interaction going here. Just take a guess. So we know that the HBCUs were founded. Oh boy, we have Dr. Williams in the room tonight. Dr. Williams, I believe is the uh, assistant provost of Norfolk State University and also a very important member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated in the Norfolk, Virginia area. So welcome, Dr. Williams. Um, so yeah, so Norfolk State, interestingly enough, uh, was one of the later, the, the HBCUs found it later on, but what about Benedict College? Does anybody want to take a guess when that institution was founded? And imagine, um, you know, sort of why, we all know why, most of us know why they were founded, but, you know, back in the, that's right, so excellent guess, um, 1870 to be exact. And we know back in the 1800s, we could not, African Americans could not be educated um, in majority institutions. So we had to form these historically black colleges and institutions uh, so that we could get equal education. And along with doing so, guess what else we formed? We formed some of the first art collections that housed works about our people. We had to do that because while our artists were equally capable of creating, they weren't accepted their works were rejected. So institutions like Hampton, which was Hampton, I think normal training school, then maybe Hampton Institute, was one of the first HBCU museums, very prominent museums um, that actually patronized artists. In fact, if you know anything about Henry Tanner, uh, they bought some of Tanner's first works. Many of you are familiar with the banjo lesson, the older man playing the banjo with the young boy, uh, I think that ended up in the collection of uh, Bill and Camille Cosby, and it now, I believe, is uh, an, at Spelman uh, University, Spelman College, um, which is where their collection is housed, a majority of it at least. Um, so the HBCUs uh, were patrons of the artists, some of the very first. They also educated students to be artists. And because, again, of society's rejection, a lot of the students turned into faculty members and very prominent artists and stayed with the HBCUs. So if you go think of, of Howard University and you think of artists like David Driscoll and Lois Mayo Jones and Elizabeth Catlett, they all walked the halls of a lot of these HBCUs, uh, in particular, the earlier ones. And so um, we really are overlooking a very rich treasure of the African-American history and story if we don't dive into the collections of the HBCU institutions. So the purpose of tonight's um, tour is to profile the two very important HBCUs that our chapter has adopted for HBCU week. And those collections are again, uh, that of uh, Benedict College, and Norfolk State University. And I'm gonna let the tour guides uh, start by saying a little bit about themselves. And then once they finish, they can also talk to you about their collections, their roles in the universities and the like. So we're gonna start with, I think um, Anna Isbell has some slides to share that have been queued up. So um, Dr. Isbell from Norfolk State, are you ready? Yes, one moment. Okay. Let me just share my screen. And while she's doing that, please get your questions ready. Um, we definitely want an interactive Q&A session when the presentations have ended. So I'm gonna stop and turn it over to Dr. Isbell. And you wanted me to talk about myself first and then the gallery, is that how? Please do give us a little introduction and say if you want something about your university that you feel is important for us to know and yeah. All right. Well, hi, um, I'm Dr. Anna Isbell. I finished my PhD at the University of Iowa and I'm an art historian. So 
I teach art history here at NSU and I also run the James Wise Gallery. Um, so our division of fine arts is often focused on community engagement and we want the James Wise Gallery to be a part of that and to be a part of exploring and experience art, um, not just for students and faculty, but also for the public. Uh, we belong in um, an urban environment and we want people from around the neighborhood, uh, from downtown Norfolk, from Virginia Beach, the general area to also come to the gallery. And in doing so, we really want the gallery to be aware of the visible and invisible barriers that it erects to its audience. I think that there is um, there is a lot of feelings of elitism that happens with art and with art museums and with art galleries. And what uh, my department and that what I would like to do is kind of tear that down a bit. Um, because for, for us, I feel like art's relevance, its authenticity, its representations of, of culture, and by culture, I mean us, right? Not technically high culture or low culture or anything like that, just us is, is what's important about art. And I think then that it is for everyone. And I think that a lot of people, what we're trying to do is convince them that our gallery and our art museums are not here to lecture you about art. We're, we're not here to make you feel culturally incompetent. What we're here to do is to offer you meaningful experiences that are here for your lives and to offer you a, a welcoming environment to explore these things. Um, so to do that, I mean, I just started as gallery director last January, so it's only been a little bit of time. Um, but to do that, we, we've started doing a couple of shows that explore uh, contemporary issues that have um, really big impacts, I think, on society, uh, not only for you know, the general Tidewater community, but also across America or even global issues. So last February, we did an unjuried exhibition for No Justice, No Peace, Unrest and Responses in 2020 America. And this was to give not only students, faculty, uh, and local artists a chance to show without having to go through a jury but also members of the community. So we had uh, just members of the community submit artworks and poems and, and things of that nature for this. And we really wanted to focus on not only the intolerance of, um, the, of African-Americans in America and how there are these issues of intolerance, but also other issues as well. So COVID also came up um, and legal problems and whatnot. And we asked the community basically to submit what they wanted rather than give them, here are these famous artists that juried into our exhibition and here's their opinions and you should you know, feel them. Rather, we wanted the community to give us their opinions. And we also held a poetry slam as well with that. So that was a, a very good project and we're continuing it actually this semester so in October, we are having a, a juried show, and this one is more focused towards a global protest, unrest, and conflict. It's also called No Justice, No Peace, but we have revamped it a bit, so it's the second iteration of it, um, because we believe that this is also a way to just kind of continue that conversation amongst our community, uh, not only around us, but also with the students and, and getting them to think a bit more about these contemporary issues. So our gallery itself, when it's not running these, these other shows, also has a, a collection of, a small collection of maybe 150 to 200 artworks. And this includes paintings, prints, ceramics, photographs, a couple of textiles, uh, much of our collection is due to the generous donation of Dr. Myron Ratek. And this is a collection that is mostly comprised of Tidewater artists, like the ones that you see on screen. Sorry, I 
got very excited about our gallery and our projects. Um, so this is, uh, we have works by say Doris Jackson, who is, a, or was, I must say, a local Tidewater artist who worked primarily in acrylics and watercolors. Um, we also have, uh, Hide your thumbnails. There we go. Jack Bretwell, uh, who did primary abstraction. Uh, he is also no longer with us as well. Um, Myra T. M. Dursky, who uh, Dr. Tech collected several of her works. And so she is um, an artist and art instructor at the Hebrew Academy of Tidewater. So a lot of the artworks from Dr. Tech's collection have to do with the Jewish experience or are collected from artists who are part of minority groups, whether that is a religious minority group or an ethnic minority group um, or both. So she uh, included works by um, M. Dursky or Camilla Fallon, these artists. And we're using these to help teach not only about artists in the area, but also about um, the connection between, oops, sorry, Jewish identity and um, the African-American experience. And we hope to pursue this later in uh, further exhibitions. Um, in addition to the work also by uh, Dr. Tech, she also is an artist herself. Um, we also have work by Ed McClooney, who is a magnificent, uh, printmaker. He earned his MFA from the University of Massachusetts and his work is um, everywhere. He's one of these big names that's in the print community. Uh, if you have print students at your colleges and they don't know Ed McClooney, they, they should. Uh, so he is absolutely wonderful. And we also got this amazing donation from uh, Jean Montesumi Ass, or sorry, Jean Montesumi Ass. I keep wanting to pronounce it in the French. And uh, she donated this box set that she has only really created 15 of. And they, a lot of them have gone to HBCUs or museums of African-American art. And it contains not only this book that she's put together, but 15 photographs uh, her videos of the Dispusky Islands and the Gula Gichi people uh, who lived in isolation there. Um, so she went there in the 1970s and, and documented their lives and, and spoke with them and created this photography project when there were fewer than um, 84 permanent residents on the island. Uh, not only do we have these collections, but I'm not in charge of it, but I do want to um, at least give a shout out or a tout our African art collection. It's also very extensive and that's at the uh, library and it displays artifacts from Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and we highly encourage not only the community to come in and uh, work with that collection, but also local high schools and of course our own students. We have approximately, I think, 900 works of art there. That's just a little bit about the collection. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, um, Dr. Isbell. Uh, very, very informative. And if you would like to stop sharing your screen. Um, there you go. So hopefully you all have a greater appreciation for some of the diversity of works um, that live on the campuses of HBCUs. As Dr. Isbell mentioned, uh, several of these works were donations. And in fact, most of the colleges uh, HBCUs and others have received numerous donations of art, of sculpture, uh, in particular African objects over the years. So what we hope to do is um, come back to you with an additional talk from Norfolk State University to learn more about their African collection at another time. This was just a taste. 
um, just to hopefully uh, whet your appetite and want you to become curious to learn more about uh, the artists that you talked about uh, in the Tidewater area, which you know has a unique um, uh, landscape relative to other areas. And that, again, to my earlier point, based on where the HBCUs are, 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 are established, um, the local terrain, the local culture and customs uh, sort of drive what's happening in the art world. So you can imagine that the Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, I have lots of relatives in that area, Hampton, Virginia, crabs. What do you think of when you think of that area? You think of coastal uh, scenery, water, seafood, right? Um, and interestingly enough, um, I have to get to Norfolk State. I have not visited that campus, but it's a big military area as well. And don't forget, it's in the area where the very first slave ship docked in 1619. So a lot of the very first African-Americans who entered this country were established there. And you can imagine that the archives that live on these HBCU campuses uh, must be extremely rich with artifacts about our history. And another interesting fact, most art collections on HBCU campuses and perhaps others actually started out in the libraries. And some of them are still in the libraries. Mm -hmm. So when Dr. Isabel mentioned that the African collection was, I believe, housed in the library, did you say? Yeah, that's not uncommon to have artifacts under the glass uh, cases, um, of very important documents that represent our very, very first um, you know, instances of many, many things. The HBCUs have been good to our culture. They've shepherded our um, history very, very well. And again, the point of the digital art collection project that I'm working with is to help bring these works to you. So at this time, I'm gonna try to share my screen again. You guys bear with me here. Um, and we're gonna learn a little bit about the second university that we have adopted for HBCU week, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated all over the world is celebrating HBCU week and we're proud to have raised 2 point million and some change that are going to go into the, uh, the, 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 the budgets of many of these HBCU um, institutions. So this is a, a a snapshot of all of the HBCU art collections that I've been able to integrate into this uh, portal so far. And you can see there are many, and we're so happy to have added Benedict and also, also Norfolk State. But before I move on, for those who may have missed the presentation, I'm gonna just click on Norfolk State's icon and go to their gallery. Dr. Isbell, whenever you um, so there's a overview of the gallery that you can read about, artist bios if you want to know more about the biographies, if you want to know, learn more about Norfolk State and just have a, an overview of the art, uh, you can always come back here to learn more, okay? So I just wanted to um, let Dr. Isbell know they have really jumped through hoops to help me make this happen. Um, and if I don't stop backing out of this technology uh, by accident, <laughs> sorry again, I have to get back into it. I will get better, it's a slip of the fingers. Um, but what I was saying is they've jumped through hoops to uh, make this happen very quickly for us. And we're very proud that they were able to do so. So we're gonna go back into the software and I'm gonna try not to to exit out and we're gonna start. Um, so while I'm doing that, um, Professor Brown, why don't you come forth and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your role and um, the, a little bit about the history of, of Benedict. Benedict. And then we'll go right into your tour. Okay, all right. Um, okay, all right. my name is uh, Wendell Brown, Wendell George Brown. And before I start, uh, getting into who I am. I just want to say I am from Newport News, Virginia. Ah. So I'm very familiar with, uh, with Hampton University, Norfolk State, 
Um, the Weiss Gallery, I've actually shown at that gallery some years ago. So it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And um, you just talked about crabs and fish and the Chesapeake Bay, and it's making me want to go home now. So it's, um, it's wonderful, wonderful. But, and, and, and also, um, one of the things that I like about this project and uh, Valerie, when you called me the, uh, on Friday um, uh, about this project, um, you know, I set, a, set back a while and I looked at it Friday or Thursday and I looked at the, uh, what the project was about. Um, you sent me a link and I looked at the link and it, 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 it was exciting for me uh, primarily uh, for the simple reason, uh, because it, what we have here is uh, Queen Nande from our Great Kings and Queens um, collection that I'll talk about uh, in a minute after I introduce myself. But I was excited because this venue or this format that you have created or creating, what it does is it, 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 it is allowing us to be able to put all of these paintings back together. Um, um, in one place. So like the Great Kings and Wings of, of, of Africa collection, that's a collection from Anheuser-Busch that was distributed through and uh, through uh, United Negro College Fund to several uh, colleges, you know, uh, it was Clark, it was Spellman, um, Benedict College, um, Xavier, Dillard, Dillard, Fisk University, um, and I think about one other, one other. But all of us have unique works in our collection that are um, that are made by artists, by African-American artists that have been lost, um, um, misplaced, uh, forgotten about. But this venue or this format is it's exceptional, as exceptional as exceptional, because what, it, what it's doing is providing a space and a place that we can bring all of these conversations, all of the artists' conversations back together in one place so we can connect how we are connected. Um, and to be able to tell the stories in, in that way and to see these artists' works back together um, again after a long time. So this is, this is wonderful. Um, again, my name is Wendell Brown. Um, um, I'm the director of the Ponders Gallery here at Benedict College. And I came to Benedict College now about 13 years ago and I came to Benedict College from Howard University where I received my MFA in, um, in painting and sculpture. And to say that I am a, um, I'm a, I'm a fiber artist. And I did my undergraduate work at the Maryland Institute College of Art in textile design fibers. And from there, uh, went to New York and you know, worked for the Dance Theater of Harlem doing costumes and, and all of those types of things. Uh, worked as an assistant to the American artist Faith Ringgold and Joffrey Holder doing costumes and work with him. And in this journey, now I'm here at Benedict College, not only as the director of the Ponders Gallery, but also the Associate Professor of Art. So it's, it's exciting again for me to, um, to number one, to listen to, to, Anna, uh, to Anna's talk. Uh, excellent, excellent talk. Um, coming from um, a historian perspective, um, because she was hitting on so many points that I thought um, were, were really relevant, points that were necessary, um, and conversations that I really want to be able to have with this collection. And I hope that people who, who come to this collection or see this collection, I'm hoping that they leave with a sense of, of, of self, with a sense of understanding, community, and, and all of those type of things. Like many historically Black colleges, as Valerie just talked about, um, Benedict College is, a, is one of those colleges that the beginning education or lessons here at Benedict College were like many other colleges. Um, you know, they taught um, um, teaching, they educated um, 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 students to become teachers, and they also educated students to become preachers. Now, one of the main reasons or one of the ideas for, for doing that, particularly after slavery, um, is so that these preachers and these teachers could go back into the community and, and educate others who were not able to come to school. So they were in that process building community. Now, as time passed on, the, the Benedict College was able to um, incorporate other courses and those other courses that the college or the institution was able to um, um, institute or, 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 or establish were courses like shoemaking. Um, and other, which also some other courses were, were those courses like uh, painting and also printmaking. 
which leaves us, which, which leads us into the art component. Art is, 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 an, um, is extremely important because it teaches us how to see ourselves. When we talk about Hampton University, um, Hampton University's first collection of Asian and Pacific works in their collection was collected to teach those students at Hampton about Asian and Pacific works, about African collections, um, and this type of thing to teach them about themselves, about their history in a tangible way. Um, the collection here at Benedict College does the same thing, right? Um, however, our collection, instead of being really rooted in, in tradition, the gallery really focuses in on contemporary works and particularly contemporary works on paper. And the collection that we have here um, in a way really uh, addresses, uh, addresses that. And what I want to, um, what I want to look at and look at here is first Queen Nandi. This work by Queen Nandi is a work that is, that was gifted to us again through Anheuser-Busch and its relationship with uh, United Negro College Fund. And the work, this work is one of the works that is highly requested from, um, from a lot of scholars, researchers who want to use the work and study the work um, 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 and this type of thing. But for, but for students here at the college, one of the things that I like about this work is primarily the story and the history that it brings. Um, Queen Nande is the mother of, of Shaka Zulu. And Shaka Zulu was maybe the founder and also one of the, um, was a great leader. Um, in um, of, of Africa was known as one of the great leaders of Africa, but even more so than the the history of this work. One of the things that excite me about this work is 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 the artist approach to to creating the painting, um, the visual language of this of, of the artwork. If we notice, uh, Queen Nande is positioned in the left hand corner. She's very prominent. In, in this work. And if we're talking about the visual non-verbal language, which is one of the things I always talk to students, particularly in the foundation fundamentals class about that non-verbal language, what are we saying? What does the artist want you to, uh, what do they want you to get from this work? In this work, Queen Nandi is prominently positioned um, in this left-hand corner where she somewhat takes over that space. The other people on the other side um, um, are, are painted in the position on the right side, but they balance out her weight. And in that presentation, for me, it shows that she is this, this, it shows her importance. And it even shows her importance for the fact that Shaka Zulu is also in the background. And I say that because she is someone who birthed Shaka Zulu. She raised him um, um, and she made him what he is. So when we're talking about uh, women issues, women rights, and all those types of things. I think this is a great piece to be able to talk about um, in, that, in that conversation. Um, the next piece, <clears throat> let me move to the next one. The next work um, that I wanted to um, point out, and I put this piece, this is, um, this is another great king. This is also from our great kings and queens of Africa collection. And this is, um, the, he was king of, uh, of Ghana. This is, um, um, Tinka Min, um, who was the King of Ghana. And one of the reasons why I put this work in this collection, why I, one of the reasons why I put this work um, in this composition to be able to talk about it is, you know, I, I've heard, you know, I don't know how true it is, but I heard that I favor him. So I said, okay, I'll put myself into this, um, into this presentation. Okay, so I, I know it's not true, but anyway. Um, but again, one of the things that I like about the work is the composition. Um, I like that it shows particularly the African-American male um, as, as in a, represent, a representation of strength, um, of pride. Oftentimes, particularly in early works, uh, the representation of African-American men, um, African-American people in general, the presentation of how they are portrayed in art, um, in the media, is often not uh, portrayed in, in, in representations of, 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 of strength and courage. Um, but this is one of the pieces, not only this piece, but 
uh, this piece along with many of the other pieces represented in this collection, I think um, are great conversations. And again, with this collection, because the works were divided between several institutions, I am so excited um, that this work is now actually finding a home with the other works eventually that were all part of the same um, 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 unique work that celebrated the great kings and queens of Africa. The, the next work um, that we have here, this is Benny Andrews. Um, and Benny Andrews is, 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 is an African-American artist uh, that paints in, in, in mixed media, mixed media paintings, mixed media collage. This is another piece that we received through a, uh, through a generous contribution, through generous gift through the United Negro College Fund. And like many of the works that we have in this collection, um, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm trying to do as the director, um, as a new director, I guess, still new since the pandemic uh, 2018, um, is to create exhibitions, as we'll see in a few minutes, create exhibitions that really introduce um, students to themselves and history. And also at the same time to be able to bring artists who are creating these works into this space so that we can not only just look at the work and experience the work, but we can make the works tangible um, and a learning experience as well. This work uh, by Benny Andrews, one of the things that I like about this work is that in Benny Andrews' later years, um, he really focused on creating or illustrating um, books, children books, um, books for young readers that um, illustrated stories about civil rights leaders, um, civil rights leaders like um, 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 Martin Luther King and others. And in this piece, this piece is from a series called Miss Josie. Um, it's a series that you can go and you can see the book Miss Josie. But Miss Josie was a, um, she was an educator. She was a real person and she was an educator in Washington, DC. And she was a civil rights leader in that she wasn't just a teacher, but she transformed uh, generations by educating them to see themselves, to see their value, to see their work, um, 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 to instill pride and all of those things in them that oftentimes that you see um, in communities, those things are absent. So she became this, this, this figure with particularly um, um, young men um, um, to be able to see themselves, young girls, uh, families as a whole, um, to generate them and to, 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 to instill in them that they could be, that they could be these things um, and all those types of things. Um, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm um, really excited about this piece. And with this whole series, the college from this series, we received about, um, about four pieces from this collection and other works went to, um, to other HBCUs. So if they can get into the mix, if they're not already here, um, institutions like uh, Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, um, North Carolina. Um, I know they have some of the Benny Andrews um, and some other works, and it would be really great to actually see all these works come together and to really be able to online, to be able to have conversations back and forth with Norfolk State, with Hampton University, with Johnson C. Smith University, Fisk University, Dillard and Clark and Morehouse, and all of these schools um, to be able to come together and have conversations and bring these works together um, in this space. Um, um, I think it, for me, that would be an exciting joy. And I think it's also interesting that uh, why this venue is so important because the history of, of art at many historically black colleges and universities, many of the works are lost. Many of the works you know, in, in those collections um, um, are lost. So this is, a, in this venue, we're able to, to reclaim them um, and this type of thing. This work um, is by Elizabeth Catlett. Um, Elizabeth Catlett was, um, is an artist born in Washington, D.C., studied at Howard University. She also was uh, taught at Hampton University, um, along with her then husband, Charles White. Um, this piece is called uh, Two Generations. In some venues, you'll see these two generations. 
Again, it's a piece that talks about um, um, community. It talks about heritage. It talks about uh, strength and character, community, and all of those type of things. This work for me, as you'll see later, I have a PowerPoint of students um, doing research here in the gallery. It's, it's important for me to be able to, 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 to have these works here at the gallery because they become tangible. Um, and for so many um, um, students here, particularly at the HBCU that I talk to, one of the things that you know, I ask them is how many, when they come in, is how many have been to museums? How many have been to art galleries? And it's very, uh, uh, you often come in with very few students haven't visited a museum or an art gallery. So this venue and being able to have these works um, makes the collection, again, tangible and an educational resource. For, right resource for students. This work um, is by Samela Lewis. Um, this is called Chloe. Um, Samela Lewis is an artist who studied at Hampton University. Um, she is widely known uh, for her works on paper and prints um, and this type of thing. And I, I like Samela Lewis. I had an opportunity to work with um, Samela Lewis um, as well as Elizabeth Catlett and some of the other artists um, when I actually taught at Hampton University a few year, years ago, 20, 30, 20 years ago, I'm not that old, 20 years ago. Um, but, but it's interesting to, um, um, to, be able to, to, to be able to work with an artist, to be able to not just work with an artist, but to be able to create alongside an artist to see how they think, um, um, to see their thought processes, to see how they talk about social issues, um, to see how they address feelings and emotions. This piece by Samela, this is also another piece by Samela Lewis, it's called Heritage. Um, and I like this piece primarily because it's an abstraction. And oftentimes like Chloe, we can look at a work of art and we can see um, what Chloe looks like. But often for me, when I talk about um, abstracted works or not works that are non-representational, the interesting to, the thing to me, you know, um, is that non-representational works, um, I, I, in a way I call them representational in the, in the sense that they are illustrating what we feel like um, and they give a sense of that emotion. And this piece for me does that. And uh, Elizabeth uh, Samela Lewis does that in black and white. Um, in representing her feel um, um, and emotion um, um, of what a heritage looked like when you talk about it um, and those type of things. And, um, uh, and you know, that's what I like about this work. That's why I'm showing this work, right? And then we have the next piece. And this next piece was actually my graduate advisor at Howard University. Um, and I think a lot of my work is in a way kind of influenced greatly by uh, Renee Stout. Renee Stout is a, uh, is a Washington DC based artist who was born in Kansas, uh, raised in Pittsburgh. Um, but her works um, are in many collections um, and a Spelman College um, um, here, Benedict College, um, as well as many other colleges. But her work in large part talks about race, identity, women issues, um, social cultural issues and all of those type of things. And, one of the things that I like about her is um, um, she talks about when she creates her work, she talks about moving into this um, um, alter ego when she creates. So the boxes in a sense, this piece is actually called uh, Secret Passport. Um, so in a sense, she is kind of creating, you create these secret identities to be able to move into spaces, to be able to, um, to create opportunities and those type of things. Um, when we talk about um, her work, we can, we can go on and on. The next area that I wanted to, uh, to, to go into is I wanted to talk about um, art as educational resources and uh, programs that we, hear, that we have here in the gallery. This is one of, the, um, uh, one of our artists here uh, from Benedict College. He graduated in 1978 from Benedict College. Um, and has gone on to do great things both in the United States as well as outside of the United States. This is Tarleton Blackwell. And Tarleton Blackwell um, 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 is a well-known artist here as well as uh, uh, outside of the United States. Um, but these are some of his works. And I put this piece in specifically because the piece that he is actually talking about here is a piece that he actually created for Alpha Kappa Alpha. 
And um, we exhibited that piece uh, just before the pandemic hit. Um, um, and, um, and now I think he has the collection back. But I was talking to someone the other day because I was trying to get the information specifically on the whereabouts of that piece. But he created that piece specifically for uh, the AKAs. All right. And then the next exhibition here, one, uh, one of the next exhibitions that we do, uh, that we did some years ago, this is comparing religion. And with this artist, I thought it was important to be able to bring other artists to have a conversation about um, connections to the African-American experience, but we're looking at it from a standpoint of religion. So this one was a multicultural exhibition um, where we had artists um, from, from both in the country, out the country, some from Hampton area, uh, from the Norfolk area, uh, from South Carolina, but all of them brought together their, uh, their own um, um, issues of religion and how they approached um, and talked about religion. Next. Next, this was um, um, an exhibition that we did was Legacies of Activism. Um, it was an exhibition about uh, civil rights in South Carolina. Um, and this one, we set up the gallery in terms of a conversation so that you were able to come into the gallery and not just walk around it in terms of being in a gallery um, and leave, but you had chairs and couches in so you could sit down and reminisce. Many of the people who were in the photographs um, attended the exhibition. So it was, it, was, it, was, um, it was a great opportunity for students to, to be able to interact with people, with students um, who were part of this whole civil rights experience in the 1960s. Next, um, in 2018, um, we, had, uh, we were honored to have Faith Ringo here um, um, to lecture and also to do an exhibition. Um, and this is one of her quilts. And uh, this is just a photograph of, of the community being able to interact with her work. And last, this is um, a few years ago before uh, Faith Ringo, we had, uh, we did an exhibition called Harriet Tubman in South Carolina. And one of the things that I liked about this exhibition is that we were able to bring Harriet Tubman's family here. We brought uh, Charles Ross and Valerie Ross, who were descendants of Harriet Tubman. And um, the quilt exhibition um, highlighted Harriet Tubman's um, work here in South Carolina, uh, which many people did not know that Harriet Tubman did anything here in South Carolina. But she was sent here as part of the emancipation, um, uh, what was happening here um, uh, post reconstruction or uh, during the Civil War um, to work. Um, and many people don't know that was here in South Carolina. So you, you asked me, Valerie, to talk about something that was good here in South Carolina. That history about Harriet Tubman here in South Carolina is something that's good about, uh, about why you should come and see this space. One of the things that I wanted to do as well is to um, show students. Students become a part of not just looking at the exhibitions, but they become um, a part of installing works. So they are able to learn every aspect of, of how to install works, how to deinstall works, how to light an exhibit, how to uh, create signage, and all of those type of things. So we are also looking at the collection, not just as a collection of art to look at, but we're also looking at it um, as a source, of, as a career source, um, as a skill set, um, particularly for art students who will possibly go into studio art. How do you create exhibits? How do you apply for exhibits? Um, uh, and all of those type of things. So it gives us the opportunity to be able to do it in this sense. Also, the collection allows us to, again, not just to be able to exhibit works, but also to be able to use the collection as a resource uh, for research. So we have our art students here in the studios. Um, I, as a art teacher, as an art professor, um, one of the things that I, I you know, I, that irritates me so much is that we often use the book and we're looking at pictures in a book, but the book doesn't give us these tangible um, experiences in terms of texture and color, um, shape, size. Often we see works in books that we think are big, but when we see them, they're about this big, or we see works that we think are this big and we, you know, we see them and vice versa. But to be able to work, uh, to sit with works by, by artists, many, many more artists um, than I was able to share here, artists like uh, Hale Woodruff, and to actually see a Hill Woodruff, 
or to be able to work with a Margaret Burroughs work or to be able to work with an A.C. Holland's, A.C. Holland's work work. Um, these are experiences that you can't pay for um, to be able to graduate and to be able to move beyond this space and to say that you actually worked with this worked with these works to be able to create works of your own. It becomes part of your narrative and it also becomes part of your conversation. Um, and as a result of that, I think that's why it is so important that um, 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 this venue or this space is, is exists. And I thank you, Valerie, for, uh, for creating it. I thank you for, um, for calling me. Um, I see my chair here, uh, Gina Moore, um, who sent the link. Um, and it's been exciting for me to, uh, I'm really excited. I don't know if you know, I see I'm a nervous guy and I'm like, ah, this is wonderful. But I, I, it's exciting because um, I should be home. I, sh I should be visiting home in a few months. Um, and Anna, your name, your, your, your visit to, to Norfolk State, the Weiss Gallery, is on my list. So you will see me, okay? I will give you a call before I get there. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us, Anna, okay, to be able to team up and do some work together. Um, I think we have a lot to share. Um, 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 I, and listening to your conversation, um, a lot of what you're doing from your perspective as a historian um, are things that I, you know, had a light bulb moment that we could bring here and vice versa. Um, and to Valerie and to Bennett and to Zena and to, I can't pronounce your name, but it starts with the N. Um, this is, has now become a community. And I think that's what this space is designed to do. That's what it should do. That's what it should be. And, um, um, and I, I truly say from my end to look forward to, to seeing many more works from our collection populated. Um, and in saying that, and I do want to work with you a lot in being able to further um, 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 develop this whole collection. That's one of the things I know I talked to uh, Ms. Moore um, um, at the beginning of the year of being able to want, being able to do that um, successfully to be able to um, keep this work around so that we can have, so generations from now, it'll be a whole new group here talking about these works in the collection. And I would just want to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, and thank you again. All right. This, is, this has been amazing for me. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just, uh, there's nothing called the impossible when you yes. allow your dreams to uh, become reality. Mm -hmm. um, the whole notion of technologically connecting, virtually connecting, all 107 HBCUR collections in this country was something on my bucket list. Yes. And during the pandemic, I had a little bit of time mm -hmm. and I started working. And now I think we are up to uh, maybe 15 schools. If you look at the tiles here, I'm not gonna spend much time because we're a little over, oh. but you can see that Benedict College, Florida Memorial, Howard, Houston Tlaxon, Morehouse, Morgan, and so on and so forth. And so what you've done tonight, uh, Professor Brown, is planted some new seeds because I really didn't think a whole lot about donations that were donated across HBCUs that reflected series of works. Yes. And now how we can bring these works back together virtually right. um, by using technology. So I certainly hope Dr. Aurelia Williams is on the phone because I'm gonna, it's gonna take a village. Yes. Um, and take some technology powerhouses like hers. Um, we also have the opportunity to work closely with the Lynx Incorporated. Mm -hmm. We'll have a, a very um, keen eye toward the arts as well. And our president of, I hope she doesn't mind, of uh, this Omicron Upsilon Omega chapter of AKA happens to sit on the National STEM Committee for the Lynx because of her technological background. So what we want to do is the, the larger HBCUs are covered, it's the smaller ones that are gonna need our help. Step one is helping them digitize right. their works mm -hmm. because that's, a, that's, that's the, the minimum you know, sort of criteria to being able to then onboard you here. 
So more to come, more to come on this project. I wanna see if there's any questions. I know we're a few minutes over, started a few minutes late though. So wanna see if there are any questions um, in the chat that anybody has that's burning that they'd like to ask. Um, any of our panelists, our members, myself, um, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to add anything, but I, I want to make a comment. Um, yes. Because, because now I, I understand uh, the flow of of, of 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 this project. A few years ago, I worked with. Uh, I was invited to um, to as an artist in residence at Cheney University mm -hmm. um, in Pennsylvania, and they took me to see their collection, which is in the library, um, and it's an outstanding collection but it needs, like many colleges, it needs attention to it. Mm -hmm. And if Cheney is not on your collection, if, if they're not on your roster of institutions to contact, contact them. They do need to be part of this. They have some outstanding works um, um, that need to be part of this conversation. Those works need to be saved. Um, and um, um, I, I know there has been a, a great turnover at Cheney now, and a lot of the people in the department are not there. So um, a lot of the works are, are kept by the library, through the library, but the library doesn't keep the work. But in all, they, they need to be contacted as well as Johnson C. Smith University. Yeah, they are all on the list. Uh, okay. In fact, I think Cheney um, and also uh, Delaware State, I heard Christian is listing in, we're gonna need your help. Mm -hmm. um, are two on the list for this year. So we're going to try to make our way uh, down the, the okay. East Coast with the northernmost schools. And, um, and, uh, and we're also looking at, at Florida. And in fact, our president's mother went to Edward Waters, mm -hmm. and she always got one call it Ethel. It's Edward Waters. Um, and just those, you know, the, the highway Florida men artists. Mm -hmm. and their influence uh, down in that part of the world. Uh, it's just a lot of interesting history. So um, I'm going to ask, I know that Ross Ridley from Norfolk State University has been patient. He is on, he is one of the admissions directors that we work closely with. As we close out, Ross, do you have any final remarks that you'd like to offer on behalf of Norfolk State University? Well, greetings and behold, sorrows, uh, family, friends, and guests. Um, I just want to bring you greetings from Nova State University. It has truly been an honor to be here with you guys and see all of the beautiful pieces and works of art um, tonight. Um, Norfolk State University doing a lot of great things. I'm actually in my hotel room in Charlotte, uh, but I had to be a part of this event tonight. Um, there's so many great pieces across our campus. I kind of been switching up my background so you can see some of them. Um, so many talented students doing so much on our campus. So I just want to tell you, thank you for inviting me. I know we kind of over time, but thank you so much. Yeah, no, and congratulations for um, partnering with us. I know that Naquanya works closely with you. Um, I'm going to ask to close us out our program. Um, uh, Vice President of Programs, um, Ms. Monica Lloyd, if you are still with us. I am still with you. Thank you, uh, Valerie. And thank you for your passion um, in terms of uh, art and bringing your, your work um, to our organization so that we can share it with the community and help spread the word. But um, and thank you uh, very much, uh, Wendell Brown, of Benedict College and Anna Isabel for sharing your knowledge of why we even have these art collections um, in these institutions, uh, the purpose and the importance of how they draw in our community and how we as African Americans are connected to the larger community and how we're able to see ourselves in these um, works of art. So I thank you, thank you, thank you for um, for sharing um, your the, the, the works at your institutions and your depth of knowledge today. I also wanna thank the program committee and especially the arts committee um, for uh, helping us put on this event today. Uh, before anyone leaves this evening, um, if you would mind, um, uh, there will be a program evaluation in the chat. So it'll give us feedback and see if we can do something like this again um, and to make it even better for you. Um, so if um, I think 
Kirsten, if you're still here, if you would mind adding that link, I'd appreciate it. And that concludes our program. Thank you very much. Yes, and the link is there. If anybody uh, could take just a minute, if there's only a few questions, we like to evaluate how we're doing and want to hear what you want to see more of or hear less of. So don't mind doing that. And if there are any questions, um, as everybody's signing off, I want to just thank you all again for coming and have a good evening if you need to take off now.